This is Gary from Night Dreams Talk Radio. I want to welcome a new sponsor to our show, PhoenixShaving.com. I know what you're thinking, right? Oh, another disposable razor company. Well, the fact is they're not. You remember the razors that your father and his father shaved with? Did you ever notice they didn't have, well, the embarrassing razor burn or ingrowing hairs or the razor bumps after they shaved? Did you notice they were also relaxed after they were done shaving? Well, the problem is these big corporations want to sell you razor after razor after razor. Think about how much money you spend a year on razors. Or do you use electric razor? <laughs> then you're going to find out what razor burn is. So you need to check out Phoenix Shaving Starter Kits. They come complete with the soap, the brush, and a two and a half month supply of blades, and the most important part of it, a all metal razor built to last generations. So, hey, you can donate it to one of your sons when they turn 18. Check out phoenixshaving.com and tell them that Gary from Night Dream said, Hey, I want one. That's phoenixshaving.com now. You're listening to Night Dreams Radio with Gary Anderson. Check out Night Dreams' website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. And you got me. Hey, Dan, are you out there tonight? I am here. Wow, how's your weather where you're uh, living at? And actually, where do you oh, live? down to 110 degrees today. 110? Where's that at? Arizona. Ari East area. I'm oh. over in Mesa, Arizona. Boy, how can you take the heat? I'm from uh, up up in the Seattle, Gig Harbor, Washington area. You know, pretty country. I got a cousin up that way. Yeah, but you know what I find? I go on road trips on my motorcycle, you know, ever so often. And I'll go up to like Reno or, uh, you know, Las Vegas and all that and ride. Somehow, when it gets after about 85 degrees, I can't take the heat. Well, if you've been here long enough, you learn that uh, it's not really hot till you get to 108 degrees. Well, I remember about two <laughs> years ago going through the deserts up in Nevada, and it was pumping like 120 some degrees, and I, oh, yeah. I, I start, and I didn't have enough water with me, and I started hallucinating, and I thought I saw all these rattlesnakes going across the road. They could have been. I'm that not sure. A hallucination. <laughs> it probably wasn't. Yeah. So why don't you tell everybody uh, in the audience out there what you do? Well, the, well, I'm a writer. I'm a full-time writer. 
uh, I make my living ghostwriting. That is, I, I write books for other people. You know, they write me a check and they put their name on the book. And for myself, I write uh, novels, westerns, mysteries, uh, thrillers, that sort of thing, with my own name on the book. And the most exciting thing that I'm involved with now is uh, my associates, Dwight and Rhonda Hull, from down in Whetstone, Arizona, have gotten into uh, investigating uh, spirits of the old Southwest. Oh, wow. Yeah, we just put out a book, uh, came out in, uh, in May. It's, it's called Speaking with Spirits of the Old Southwest, Conversation with Miners, Outlaws, and Pioneers Who Still Roam Ghost Towns. And what we do is we will go to a, a, a historic site and uh, see if we can get some of the spirits who inhabit that place to talk with us. And essentially, uh, we research the history of the Old West by talking to the people who lived there at that time. It's fascinating. Oh, I bet. Uh, is there many ghost towns left? I know going through Nevada, I had, you know, it was really hard to find anything, uh, you know, much standing other than Virginia City, which is nothing more than a tourist attraction. Right. Uh, it, it would probably surprise you. Uh, one of the things we like to do in a book, uh, we are uh, enormous history buffs in addition to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the speaking with ghost parts. We're enormous history buffs, and we're trying to bring to the attention of, of people that there are tremendous historical sites of historical importance that you drive by every day that you don't know about. Oh, that yeah. you could, you know, you could uh, park on the side of the road, maybe walk a hundred yards, maybe you know, hike a mile or so, and you would be at a tremendously important historical site. Well, you know what I found, uh, Dan. You know is. Yeah. You know, when I, because uh, I used to do a lot of photography and I used to go out and take pictures of ghost towns. And, yeah, you know, but I, right in front of my own eyes, I'd be at some old, you know, building, old farmhouse or uh, old store building, what's left of it. And there would be people, you know, instead of taking pictures, they were taking souvenirs. Yeah, that's the, that's the downside. Yeah, and it, it, and it really started. That is spray paint. They spray paint and stealing Drives whatever they, yeah. Well, they look at it, oh, gee, it's not owned by anybody. And, you know, a lot of that stuff is still owned by somebody that the land it's on. And it's, exactly. And, and it's so yeah. bad to see, you know, something that, uh, well, it will, it will never be able to be replaced. And, you know, just seeing people taking souvenir, you know, uh, pieces of wood or, you know, whatever they can find. It's, it, I was, in fact, actually taking a picture of an old gas station one time, and it's been abandoned probably about 30, 40 years, but it still had two pumps in front of it. And while I was taking pictures, a guy in a pickup truck, you know, with, with his friends, they decided they wanted the pump. Oh, yeah, those things are, uh, you know, they have a pretty good value on the souvenir market. Oh, yeah. The collectors yeah. have put them in their man cave. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So but we try to, uh, one, we, we respect the law, but we also try to, re we also respect people's property rights. And we also, uh, you know, your listeners might find this interesting. We try to respect, you know, the property because there are still people there who were there at the time. This is still their home in many, many respects. Okay. Now, are we talking about the living or the dead? The spirits. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and some you know some places are on private property, so it's obviously you know someone you know owns the property, maybe lives on the property. But uh, there are spirits who still inhabit those places, who enjoy those places, and we don't want to trash it, you know, out of respect for them. Oh yeah. yeah. What what made you decide to write this book? Well, actually, uh, Rhonda Hull and I were involved in a group, and we uh, used our psychic abilities to look for missing children. This was you know, several years ago, but we did it for many, many, many years. And uh, I was uh, working on a particular cold case, and I call, I call on Rhonda as part of my, uh, it was a sub-team of the, the main group, I called on Rhonda because she is so good at what she does, to be one of my team members. And through that work in that one case, uh, we got to be good friends on you know, online and through telephone conversations. And they live about uh, two hours uh, south of me. And one day we just decided, you know, why don't, uh, Dan, why don't you come down there, you, me, and Dwight, and we'll get together, we'll have lunch, and see, you know, to see what we, what we like about each other. So we went down, we became friends, became pretty good friends, and we started saying, well, you know, this might be interesting because they're intuitives. It was their, they have the ability, especially Rhonda, to act physically see spirits. And Dwight is an intuitive. He can, he can sense them pretty well. And I do not have that skill, but I'm a pendulum dowser. And we were wondering, you know, what if we put our three skills together 
and tried to make contact. Would that work? And would it, you know, would it be uh, more effective? And we went out and we said, well, let's just try a case. And we went out to a, an abandoned jail from the uh, oh, 1880s, 1890s, turn of the century, called Cortland, Cortland Jail. And we sat down and said, let's just do this as an experiment, and we'll just see what happens. And uh, we, we recorded it on video, and we sat down, and uh, by God, we made contact. It was a real powerful experience. And we said, hey, we're, uh, we're on to something here. We were able to actually release a spirit who felt trapped on the earth that first time out. It was, it was an incredible experience. And, uh, and I can tell you about that later if you want. But from that point on, we said, well, let's do some more, some more of this uh, speaking with spirit stuff. And somewhere along the line, you know, the light bulb went off on somebody's head, and we said, hey, we ought to put this in a book. Somebody might find this interesting. And so, uh, you know, me being a professional writer, I said, well, let's get the information, and I'll write it up. And we wrote it up, and uh, the book is kind of t- has been published now, and it's taken on a life of its own. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I was yeah. telling you before we came on the air, anything to do with the paranormal right now is like hotter than it's ever been. And I, I've been in broadcasting one form or another off and on, oh, since the uh, mid-70s. Uh, and I, I just watched like the last 10 years uh, paranormal just like blossom. You know, it, it's so interesting. But, you know, the Old West, that's, I mean, how many, how many like little ghost towns is there left or or is it just buildings here and there it depends there are you know there are legitimate what you would consider ghost towns and then there are ruins and then there are abandoned mines and then there are places that are uh, old grave sites grave towns uh and then there are places where you have just an abandoned mine or you might find the the remnants of an old shack or just the uh, the, the foundations of an old house so it, it kind of runs the gamut oh wow yeah, so you have everything from a ruin that you might not even see if you walk 10 feet by it, all the way up to, you know, like a tombstone, which is a National Register of Historic Places ghost town. Oh, wow. Yeah. What's, what's like, uh, in your area, or the places that you explored that actually had something, you know, quite a bit intact uh, to it yet? Well, there's an area not too far from, uh, from Tombstone. Uh, about 14 miles from Tombstone, there's a, a area called Ghost Town Road, and there are several ghost towns uh, of varying descriptions along that road within a few miles. So you can run into, uh, well, Cortland, the place I told you about. There's another uh, ghost town called Pierce, which is uh, still has people uh, actually living in it and also living amongst the ruins. And there's another place that uh, is rather prominent in a book called Gleason, which has uh, a beautiful little museum there. And there's some people living around in the area, and there's some substantial ruins there. The old school, uh, uh, courthouse is there. Uh, the old hospital is still there with the walls, adobe walls still standing. What what time frame did they, they uh, turn into a ghost town? I mean, how how many years back? Do you have any idea? Well, that time you're talking roughly, uh, I would say, uh, very late 1870s to 1880s, 1890s. Oh, and a lot wow. of those ghost towns, you know, had a lifespan of maybe only uh, a year or even less. And uh, once the silver played out, or like in 1873, when uh, the, the bottom dropped out of the market, the town shut down. They packed up, tore down the towns, and literally the boards from one town would <laughs> would go to the next next town, and that would build up the next town. Oh, so basically what they were doing, if I got this right, uh, Dan, they would basically, you know, and they figured, hey, everything in the mine is gone and it's not worth being here anymore. They pack the exactly. whole town up and go down the road and reconstruct a, a new town with, from the old yeah, town. Yeah, the new town may, not, may only be, more, you know, four or five miles down the road, but that was where the next strike was. Yeah. You know, up here where yeah. I, I live up uh, is a place called... Uh, Buckley, Washington, and there is an old uh, abandoned, well, uh, shafts from an old uh, town and uh, a coal uh, mine uh, going back to around the 1890s. And it was in existence for about 11 years before they mined it all out. But, I mean, that had a, a population back then of like about close to 3,000 people, which is not shabby. You know, and they yeah. actually even had the railroad go up to the, 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 the little uh, short mountain uh, going to the town. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, also, the bad part is a lot of people go up there hiking and, you know, there's still some shafts open that oh, occasionally yeah. people be walking and all of a sudden 
they end up missing. And what happens is they fall into a little shaft. It drops down about 600 feet into the mountain. Exactly. That's a, you don't go up.